All right. Uh, let me put the notes up here on the screen. Let's do that. Okay. If you've got the notes and you're following along, we're on page eight. Ready for the Church of Philadelphia. So let's read in Revelation chapter 3, uh, verse, uh, verse 7, verse 8. Yeah, that's wrong there. It should be. Oh, no, I'm in the wrong chapter. That's why that's wrong. Uh, study 2. Yeah, study 2 and 3 are out there. It should be. There's two separate papers out here. Right. One is study two, one study three. What happened to study one? Study one is out there also. <laughs> but it's in the it's in the file box. We have confusion. All right. Verse seven. Let's so you're on two. Right? Are, yeah. Are they both out there? They are, but the one doesn't say study two, it says chapters two and three. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, uh, verse 7, chapter 3 and 2, the angel of the church in Philadelphia write these things, says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens, I know your works, see, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name, indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie, indeed I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you, because you have kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole earth, to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we uh, look again at this uh, set of letters to the churches in Asia, Father, we pray that you would give us uh, wisdom as we look at these things and counsel that comes directly from your son uh, to these churches and endures to us even today to find the things that uh, that would apply to us as uh, individual believers as well as a church and put them into action uh, led by your Holy Spirit. We pray that you give us wisdom in your word tonight. Bless the time we share in fellowship and uh, studying your word. And we pray that you bless the children and the teens as they uh, are in your word tonight as well in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Uh, the letter to the Church of Philadelphia, this is the sixth of the seven letters. We'll hopefully look at both uh, the last two letters tonight and move on to uh, the next topic next week. Um, Philadelphia means city of brotherly love. And again, you have the maps and the last couple pages of uh, your notes. So if you want to take a look at where Philadelphia was located, it's not, this one is not in Pennsylvania. Uh, this, But this is where that comes from and the more you get into God's word or have over the years I'm sure you've noticed as you travel places that there are a lot of biblically named towns and cities across the United States and that really is a is a real testament to how, what kind of impact the Bible had uh, in uh, the formation of the United States of America you have places like Smyrna and we've already looked at at the city of Smyrna and you have places like Philadelphia and you have some of those cities as well as others, uh, Bethlehem and uh, 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 you even have some Jerusalems in the United States because they took those names from the Bible, uh, the Bible being such an important book to the early uh, formation of, this, of the nation, unfortunately not so much today. Uh, but Philadelphia means just what they say in Philadelphia or in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It is the city of brotherly love. It comes from two Greek words. Uh, we use we talk about those words for love in the Greek pretty often as we're preaching. 
Uh, we talk a lot about the, the Greek word for love, agape, which is that demonstrative love that God has towards us and we should have towards each other. But the uh, phileo love, we talk about quite a bit as well, and that is brotherly love. Uh, and so phileo, Adelphia, Delphia is a Greek word or a form of a Greek word for city. So you have the city of brotherly love. Uh, it was founded in 190 BC and it was an important city along the Imperial Post Road. And you heard probably both in Bible studies as well as just in general history about the, the, the Roman road system was a real innovation in its time, a real innovation of the Roman Empire. And so this part of the Imperial Post Road was part of that Roman road. It's, uh, you know, the, the modern day, uh, I won't say equivalent, but similar thing would be our, our modern uh, interstate highway system where you have these roads that are pretty well, well, I'm going to say they're well maintained, but generally well maintained. How about that? Uh, always in a state of being maintained. Uh, but the Roman roads, interestingly enough, that 2000 years ago, and you still have portions of those roads that are still in existence uh, <laughs> that you can still find uh, that have held up. Uh, and if you followed the news a couple of years ago, there was a quite a bit of, uh, uh, I don't know, rhubarb about uh, Roman cement and how they couldn't figure out why the Roman cement was, or concrete was, was uh, still holding up and what's the secret to the Roman concrete. And even when they thought they got there, they said, well, we think this is what it is. So even with all these, these fancy gadgets that are supposed to tell us that carbon, you know, is, you know, different things are 10 million years old. They can't figure out what's in the Roman cement that makes it so durable. Uh, ought to make us think. Um, but uh, those, Rome, those roads were vital, uh, both for commerce as well as for troop move movements in the Roman Empire. And one of them uh, was uh, right uh, along uh, or was set right, <laughs> Philadelphia was set right along one of the, that Imperial Post Road. And so it uh, facilitated it being a major trade city and probably also facilitated it having a lot of troops going by it uh, pretty frequently. It's located about 30 miles southeast of Sardis, modern day al Shahir, Turkey. And you also have the modern uh, Asia, modern Asia Minor or Turkey ca uh, calendar map on your notes so you can see where that's located today. Well, with all the, the letters, we have those five C's. This is going to be absent one of them, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But the first C is, how does Christ represent himself to the church? And for each one of these letters, Christ gives some description about himself that uh, concentrates usually on part of his character or his attributes. And it's the same here. He says that he is the one who is holy, uh, the one who is true and the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. And both of these speak to the authority and the sovereignty of Christ. And the neat thing about one of the neat things about these seven uh, statements about the attributes and character of Christ in the letters is all, almost all of them um, give us opportunity to connect Christ with God, not just in a relational way, but shows that he has the same attributes of God. And this is one of them. Uh, these seem like simple statements, but when we look at that, that last one, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens, that is a big statement because it tells us that Christ has absolute authority to, uh, to open or shut or to command or uh, uh, begin or, or end any matter. Uh, and that's, that's powerful. That speaks directly to the sovereignty of Christ and the sovereignty of God, uh, as well as his authority. Uh, it also emphasizes his holiness and his truthfulness, uh, both the fact that he tells the truth, but that he is absolutely true as well. He's always dependable and trustworthy. Uh, if you have any comments or questions along the way, please feel free to say to, to speak up or <coughs> you don't even have to raise your hand. All right. Con the, the second C in each one is a commendation or a, a compliment that he gives to each church. And Christ points out concerning the church in Philadelphia that they had a little strength and had been faithful. 
And boy, you know, this is one of those little nuggets, I think, in <clears throat> scripture that's really heartening for us as believers and even for churches. And I think a lot of medium to small churches uh, these days probably feel like this. It sort of always feels like we're going uphill. Uh, but as long as we have a little strength, and as long as we're faithful, whether it be as believers or as a church, uh, you know, it's, it's okay. Uh, that's what's required. And he, he compliments him for continuing on in that, that little bit of strength. Uh, and he compliments them concerning their faithfulness. And their faithfulness is not just to the task. Uh, it's not just keeping the doors of the church open. The faithfulness is to Christ. Uh, they are faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his word. And that's of utmost importance. And that's what Christ sees as uh, commendable in their case. He says that they had not, they had not denied Christ as many had, which is the flip side of it. And that, that just confirms the fact that the kind of faithfulness that he is talking about here um, in keeping his word is, is just that. They, they held fast to their testimony for Jesus Christ, and they held fast to the, uh, the truth of God's word, and they were not willing to compromise on it. Uh, and because they, were, they had done those things, Christ could say to them that they had persevered. They had not denied his name, and uh, therefore Christ would keep them from severe trial. Uh, possi a possible reference to the rapture as we go on, because he says that um uh, why did we say that Shut, I'm, so sorry. I'm sorry i gotta re say again intent yes thank you uh i will keep you from the uh from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who uh, dwell on the earth and he says behold i am coming quickly now we know it's not for them a reference to the rapture because Time has passed uh, and that church has passed into history, but it's a promise that each generation of the church can hold on to. Christ is coming at any moment. And again, well, I think we're going to talk about that in a second, but the idea of quickly here uh, means imminently. It doesn't mean in terms of time as it could, uh, it's, it's going to be a short time or it's going to be a, 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 a in 10 minutes or in 10 years, but that it can happen at any time. So the idea of uh, him saying that to them then is uh, an encouragement that, Christ, that he could return for them at any time. It continues to be an encouragement to every generation of the church, and it continues to be an encouragement for us today to live as though we may meet Christ tomorrow because it's, in, it's within the absolute realm of possibility that any given one of us could meet the Lord uh, because we die and our life is a vapor. We can meet him face to face uh, before this day ends or Christ could come back. Both of those events, either our death or uh, the return of Christ are both always imminent. They can happen at any time. Uh, I had to make a run down south because we had, uh, you heard us talking about it on the way in tonight. Some of you that we had a limb go through our camper down there. And uh, I haven't told my wife this yet, but, uh, you know, I went at 10 o'clock Sunday night and almost had a wreck. <laughs> and so, I, unfortunately, when you ride with me, you're reminded frequently that life could end at any point. Uh, <laughs> but it wasn't my fault. The big semi just kind of came over and uh, but it kept me awake the rest of the time. So. <laughs> Uh, but it, it's a reminder. We have reminders uh, frequently, whether it be events like that or just seeing someone that we know or knew uh, or loved who passes away, uh, that life can end at any moment. The return of Christ is the same way. And we should always be ready as Christians to meet the Lord, uh, be, be found living for Jesus Christ. And that goes right to what we're going to be talking about next week. We're looking at the rapture again. Uh, you know, one of the... Uh, detractors when they when they when they uh, oppose the rapture the idea of the rapture is that it makes christians complacent well you know if scripture teaches it it teaches it you can't use an argument like that but even if you could the 
rapture should make us complacent. The rapture should make us all the more uh, diligent to be living our life for the Lord because the Lord could return at any moment. And so we want to be found working. We want to be found living our life faithfully for the Lord. Um, condemnation. This is one of two churches along with Smyrna that has no condemnation. And what a what a gold star, you know, there's no condemnation. There's no, no rebuke here. Yeah. I have no idea what that means. It says, the Lord only will receive no condemnation. Okay, each one of the churches, as we've been going through them, has these five C's, of a compliment and a condemnation. Christ didn't condemn them in any way. He didn't say, you need to fix this, okay. uh, like he did with, and we're going to see in the next one, it's pretty severe. But in this one, he had no negative word to say. Let's put it that way. Uh, so Phil Philadelphia had no condemnation from Christ, no negative word from Christ, no, you need to repent of this, or you need to deal with this person, or you uh, tolerated this teaching, as we saw last week in Sardis and then in, the, in the churches before, except for Smyrna. They had all had something that Christ drew their attention to that they needed to deal with in their church and frequently the way to deal with it was to repent was to change their direction in what they were doing and turn their attention back to uh, doing it the way God would have them to do it or Christ would have them to do it more specifically uh, the counsel even though there's no condemnation there is counsel given to uh, the church in Philadelphia Christ says that he has given them an open door uh, and they were responsible to act. And we have a, a couple of references in scripture, this one and from Paul himself, who talk about that open door for Paul. It was the, the open door to Macedonia. Um, and we still use that phrase or hear it fairly frequently in, in uh, Christian circles. Uh, and it's a good biblical phrase. If the door is genuinely given by the Lord. And uh, one of the things I'll, uh, I'll tell people from time to time is we have to be careful because the devil can open doors too. And that's clear in scripture. Uh, you go back to the, the, the foolish young man in the book of Proverbs who, who goes out at night and he's going to the wrong part of town and he finds the open door of uh, the harlot and goes into it. The scripture says he doesn't know that, that he's, he's uh, possibly uh, bringing an end to his own life. And so when we say, you know, well, I had to do it because God opened the door. Uh, make sure that you depend on more than just circumstances to deduce an open door. Make sure that you still pray about circumstances and situations in your life, particularly when you're, you're maybe desperately seeking God's will for something. Circumstances are the least best, uh, uh, what do I want to say, the least best, uh, uh, ah, I am having trouble with my words tonight. I'm sorry. Confirmation. Validation, confirmation. That's good too. Uh, at least that's confirmation of God's will. Uh, it doesn't mean they're not, but if you're only looking at circumstances to the exclusion of praying about it, seeking Godly counsel, making sure that it's uh, it's in line with God's will, God's word, which is always part of God's will, then you're eliminating a lot of valuable information if you're just going by circumstances, because we have to remember. Also, that not only can Satan open doors, but we can bang our heads against doors so often, uh, so many times, because we want something to happen that we can create it and, and then call it God's will when it not necessarily is. And I don't say that in an accusatory way. Unfortunately, I say it by bitter experience through my life. I've made things out to be God's will when I look back and I say, that was not God's will. That was Jim's will. Uh, but I tagged it as God's will. And what a mistake. Uh, and what a waste of time. And so um, he, Christ, though, says here, you do have an open door. And the open door he doesn't uh, specify about, but it's you, in the other context where it's used with, with Paul, it is an open door of ministry. It is an opportunity to uh, take the gospel to another part of the community or maybe even a different city or maybe a group of people. But God, Christ had given them an open door to uh, to move forward uh, as a church and move forward in their ministry to reach people for Christ or to grow believers in their, uh, in their faith. He also counseled them to hold fast uh, what they had. And so when we go back and look at what they had, well, they had a little strength. 
uh, you know what? Again, sometimes a little strength is all that's required, and it's all that's required to spark more strength and to to grow and to uh, uh, to become stronger in their faith. And most people know that if you've ever been injured, uh, you and you injure something that doesn't have much strength in it. Whether it's I know Jim's dealing with his eyes over here, and others of you have dealt with other things, or you have a major surgery, you have a little strength. The only way to get more strength than that is, is what? Is to exercise it. And, and so what Christ is saying here, when he says to hold to that, hold fast to it, it's not a stagnant hold. It's not a hold, you know, gripping on like you grip a rope. It's the idea of exercising their faith uh, and use it, continue to use that faith so it can continue to grow. And so even though we could look at it kind of uh, cynically and say, well, it didn't look like they had much, they had enough, they, they had sufficient. And that's what, Christ, that's what Christ provides to us, that which is sufficient uh, and uh, gives us the ability to, to build on that, to grow it. Uh, they were to remember that Christ was coming quickly and we've already talked about that. But again, this is a phrase that's, that's already been used. It's gonna be used really frequently as we get to the latter chapters of Revelation that Christ reminds that he is coming imminently, that it could happen at any moment. Uh, let's look at the call and then we'll open it up for questions and comments. Uh, overcomers, and we've talked about this, uh, this term overcomers in each one of the letters it's used in all seven letters. It is a, a term that refers to all believers, uh, not just those that, uh, that work even harder but, but all believers are, are overcomers, and uh, we see that in the, the book of First John. Uh, and you can go back to the beginning of this, this study sheet if you want to read up on that. Uh, but the overcomers will be made a pillar, uh, which it just means given a place of honor. And there are a couple of uh, uh, great thoughts on being a pillar. And you, you used to hear the term being a pillar in the church uh, years ago. You don't hear that much anymore. But uh, pillars can be a positive or pillars can be a negative. I remember uh, many years ago, we bought tickets to something. I can't remember what it was. It was either a theater thing or a sporting event. But I couldn't believe the amazing deal I got until I got there. And then I knew I got an amazing deal because it was what they call today a partially obstructed view. Uh, there was a pillar. And so pillars sometimes only get in the way. <laughs> uh, they, are an obstruction. they are an obstruction. Yeah. Uh, but uh, particularly decorative pillars. If you've been to something that, that has a lot of decoration set up and you get start to look at it and say, this structurally, this does nothing. This is just to add, you know, ambiance or whatever. Uh, a lot of times what they end up doing is getting in the way. But a genuine pillar is, uh, is functional, it's supportive. And it is, uh, if, it's, if it's built well, it's going to be put in a place where it's not going to be an obstruction, but it's going to, it will have a place of honor. And the best place for pillars uh, oftentimes are behind uh, the person who is the person of honor. And that gets closer to the, view, the, the point of view here. We're going to be with Christ or in Christ, and Christ is the focal point in eternity. And we, we will be uh, with him on the stage, if you will, or in the back, but in the background because he's the focal point. And so uh, in the temple of God, uh, we will be pillars and we'll go out, go in and go out no more uh, or shall go out no more. Uh, that's so neat because, it, you know, I've heard people look at it and say, well, isn't that boring? We're going to be stuck in the temple of God. That's not the idea there. The idea is not that we're going to be stuck in one place or we're going to be stuck in one room for eternity. The idea is that we're always going to be connected with Christ. And because we're connected with Christ, we're always connected with God for eternity. And we're, we already are. If you know Christ today, we already have that position uh, validated. But this is the realization of it. This is when it's going to be made real. It will have that fullness of relationship that, uh, that can't be compromised, that uh, sin is not going to affect the fellowship because there'll be no more sin, no more pain, no more tears. Those things will be gone. So we have the fullness of that relationship with Christ and with God the Father. 
Uh, he says each one will bear the name of God of the new Jerusalem uh, and, uh, and Christ's new name. There's a little note there that this is the first reference of the new Jerusalem in the book of Revelation. Uh, but this is neat, too, because we saw last week with the uh, church of Sardis that we're going to give be given a, a stone, a white stone with our own secret name written on it. Here, we're going to be we're going to bear the name of God. We're going to bear the name of the new Jerusalem and that 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 new name of Christ. Uh, perhaps the same one he talked about, um, and not in Sardis, I'm sorry, it was in one more before that. It was in Thyatira. Um, that new name that Christ gives us. And what that always speaks to when something is written on us or uh, is, is put on us or we bear it, it means, it, it has the idea of ownership. And it's a, ter it's a lousy example in one sense, but it helps us understand and I know this just happened to John. Uh, if you have your name and your ID tag on your luggage, then chances are your luggage is going to find its way home. And I know John, uh, they had they had luggage lost on your last trip, right? Or was was it yours or was it Deb's? It's Deb's. Well, it was Deb's, but it was in my name. It was in your name, or the other way around, or something. Yeah. They 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 switched the luggage gotcha. tags, yeah. <laughs> and so it had had my name tag. On the luggage and they're looking for her luggage oh i gotcha <laughs> so that was part of the connection i gotcha so the idea is here even though god's never going to lose us there is all these extras that we're told about as we go through revelation and as we go through the gospels as well that we bear the name of Christ. We bear the name of God. We bear the name of New Jerusalem. We even have this new name that Christ gives us. We can't be lost. It's like Christ telling us in the Gospel of John that we're in God's hand. We're in Christ, or in Christ's hand. We're in God's hand. And then Paul telling us later in Ephesians that we're sealed up uh, by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Uh, all that is, in a sense, unnecessary. All we have to be is in one person of the Godhead's hand. We're absolutely secure. But we get these visuals that this, you not only are secure, you're triply secure. And when we come to this, it just adds more security. And it's, it's more for our sake now than it is for our sake in eternity. Because once we see, once we see Christ and once we see God, there's not going to be the need for that because we're going to, as John says in first John, we're going to see him as he is. And it's going to make sense to us. Even even at what we know about God's word and the relationship we have with the Lord today, we still don't see him as he is. We, I won't ask you to raise your hand. I'll raise it for all of us. How many struggle with your faith sometimes? We struggle. We struggle. And, but once we see him, the struggle is going to go away because it'll, it'll all fall into place. Uh, once the, 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 the shroud, if you will, of sin is taken away, it'll all fall into place. But for us now, all of this, all these things add uh, security and we ought to hold on to them. Next week, when we look at the rapture, we'll be reminded again, why does he tell us about the rapture and emphasize the rapture? Comfort one another with these words, he says, uh, as he talks about the rapture. These are words of comfort uh, to guarantee that we have this kind of security uh, with the Lord as his people. And then uh, finally, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Uh, the way he ends each one of these letters, uh, if you are a believer, that's the kind of ear he's talking about, spiritual ear. And every, every believer is given a spiritual set of ears, not just the physical ears, but to hear what the Spirit says. And we hear the Spirit, I, and you know, really haven't talked about that, but just take just a second. The fact that he brings the spirit, what the spirit says to the churches requires spiritual ears. He's not just talking about listening with these ears, although that's important. He's talking about listening with spiritual ears. In order to hear with spiritual ears, of course, first of all, you've got to know Christ as your savior. So Paul says to the Corinthians, the natural man or the unsaved person can't understand the things of God. They have to be spiritually appraised. And to best hear what the spirit says, we have to be walking in the spirit. All right, comments or questions on the church to Philadelphia before we go to Laodicea? It's, you know, I've thought about this and, you know, 
it's just a constant spiritual warfare here on the earth. So we have the flesh that we have to say no to, and we have the world that we're around, and then the devil tempts us. And I can imagine what it would be like if there wasn't spiritual warfare. I know. It, it just blows my mind. Yes. Yeah, if you didn't hear what John says, he said we have, uh, you know, we struggle every day as believers. We have the flesh and we have spiritual warfare. You know, I could throw in a couple other things. We, we, and part of the spiritual warfare, unfortunately, a lot of times, all too often involves other Christians. We're, we're with fellow believers, which should not be uh, because we already got enough to deal with as we walk through this world. And he said, it's just, uh, hard I, he may have used the word impossible if he didn't i'm going to throw impossible to understand how it's going to be without the struggles of the flesh without the struggle of sin without the struggle of satan's ongoing attacks uh it's and, and then we can throw in just general distractions uh in the world and in our lives and so uh when those things are taken out of the way uh we can understand why uh heaven or eternity is characterized as a place of peace and in hebrews as we've been seeing on tuesday nights uh a place of rest and it's not that we're just going to sit around and rest you know set back uh, eternal hammocks you know i'm not a big fan of hammocks i don't know about you but yeah. i don't find them very comfortable but um whatever your comfort uh, rest uh your, your, your the comfort the, the the furniture like like the restaurant it's not going to be that the rest is more about we have a rest from sin and from the spiritual struggle. And there's no concern of death. Again, no concern of tears, those things that, uh, that take up a bunch of our time. No concern about what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, what we're going to wear. Those things will be uh, a part of what God makes uh, provision uh, for us. Uh, so all those things will be taken out of the way. Huh? Will things wear out? It, you know, if the... Do I need to buy new shoes? After <laughs> you know, I, I just can't do that. Yeah. And, and when we go to eternity, we don't know because all things will be new. And in the kingdom, you know, the precedent, of course, there's a precedent for things not wearing out, and that's the wilderness wandering. That God provided what they would eat, what they would drink, what they would wear. And those things did not wear out, and there was no end of the provision of the manna until they came into the land. Uh, the dip, the big diff. Well, I don't know that there will be a difference for you and I. There'll be a difference. There'll be no complaining. But as we get later in Revelation, uh, there will be people, human, uh, that are not redeemed yet that go into the kingdom, and there's uh, un unbelievably there will be complaining, even though Christ will be there in their midst, and. Uh, and I'm, we'll look forward to talking about that when we get to the end of the book. What else on Philadelphia or questions so far? Uh, I got Marty first and then we'll get you guys. Well, Christ is, uh, is telling uh, the church in verses 12 through uh, 13 is in the eternal state. This will occur, not in the millennial state, right? In where we're at now? Uh, when he talked about writing a new name on oh. him, and... well, that's a good question. I don't, I don't think so. I think this, I think this occurs when we are united with Christ. But I, I wouldn't be hard and fast on it because the the problem always in uh, there's always a problem in timing out when these things happen. Uh, because you have a big set of, of saints that come out of the tribulation. And they, they're uh, uh, an interesting lot. And so uh, that, that's what gives, and we'll be talking about this later in Revelation 2, gives uh, kind of theologians fits about when is the marriage supper of the Lamb going to occur? Is that going to occur you know, during the tribulation? Or is that going to occur be just before the millennium? Is it going to occur in the millennial kingdom? And the, you know, the definitive answer to that is, we don't know, even though you've got a lot of books written that say, absolutely, this is when it's going to happen. I, I'm always a little more uh, hesitant to define God's schedule when he hasn't clearly laid it out. <laughs> well, he talks about the New Jerusalem. Yes. The New Jerusalem 
is, is in the eternal <laughs> right. state, right? Not the millennial state. Well, <laughs> it, it's a little bit like the uh, the uh, the second coming of Christ. That that really is kind of the foretaste of that is the rapture. The fullness of it is at the end of the tribulation. You have a radically new Jerusalem in the millennial kingdom because you have everything, uh, the every mountain being brought low and every valley made high and. And Zechariah 14, how the whole topography of Jerusalem is going to change. You have this massive temple that's going to be put in place. So is it talking about that new Jerusalem or the new new Jerusalem in, in eternity? And so I, I don't think it's all that problematic because it, it's, what it's really talking about is we have access, that we have identity and access. And so we have, we're going to have something much more substantial than uh, a driver's license or a passport, uh, we're going to have it uh, as part of us that we belong there, um, and that's kind of the the idea is that we have we have access to to come and go into the new Jerusalem as the Lord wills. JC, well, back up here in that. Well, I have a comment about twelve, but uh, up here where he says uh, Jesus said to me. I have put before you an open door which no one can shut because you have little, mine says little power, but little strength. And I have kept my word and I have not and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue, uh, I will make them come down about for it's, it's the way I take it. I, I, I could be wrong because I'm all the time, but because they were relying upon. They, they didn't need but just a little time. They didn't need, they relied upon the strength of, of the Lord, Lord yeah. to accomplish what they are accomplishing. And it, it was, they didn't do it on their own strength, their own power. They didn't get sidetracked with that stuff. They they, they relied solely upon the Lord for their strength and, and, and the way they're dealing with their everyday life. Back to 12. What? Is it 12? No, it's, it, yeah, it's the end of 12. And you know, what are the, what, We'll have a new name, but it looks like there he will have a new name. For, the way I take it, he'll have a new name, but it will be an intimate name. Like I, I don't know about you, but I have a name for my wife, yeah. and she hates it when I mention it. But I call her this at the house, or Tina. That's uh, anyway. I, I don't know if everybody has a, a, a name for someone in their life, like Ange. Angie's is Ange. All, all, everybody I know that I care for has a. A, a special name, not a name that everybody else uses, and and so it's a it's a it's a it's a, 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 a intimate type thing. Is the way I take it that we'll have a name for it. How does this thing? He says, "In my new name." Yeah. So it is. Will his new name be? I will have a new name for him that I use when I communicate with. I don't know if that's what that means, but. I mean, well, it's, it's it, it could be it's and there's there's a couple of ways to interpret that. Yeah, it can be the name that he's talked about before that he has for each believer, or it can be a name that he gives us to call him by. And either one is is acceptable because it's not perfectly clear. No. But again, the general point is that it's it, it, it speaks to the intimacy we have in our relationship with Christ. And, uh, and so it, it, that closeness of relationship, it, it, you know, there's that, that is something we can understand. And you gave a good example, the, the nicknames and pet names we have for the people that are closest to us and uh, their names that nobody else calls them. I mean, their names that I call my wife, I, nobody else better call them, uh, you know, and, and vice versa, because they're the names, they may be fairly generic, but uh, still, I don't want JC calling my wife by the name that I call her. And so there's uh, that intimacy we, we have that's reflected in the way we address one another. And the, the neat thing is that, that even though it doesn't diminish the fact that he's Lord, uh, it emphasizes the other relationships we have with Christ as friend and brother. Um, and so the, it, it's an amazing thing 
And, you know, we talked oftentimes about, we're just coming out of Easter and one of the memes that I saw go around, which has been before there were memes, you know, that, uh, that Christianity is the only religion where the, the, uh, where the savior rose from the dead. Um, it's really, when you start looking closely at other religions, it's really the only re religion where there is a friend to friend, brother to sister or brother to brother relationship with with the savior i mean the other ones are are domineering or overpowering or uh, uh, mean <laughs> mischievous um, dictatorial. say again dictatorial, dictatorial. Uh, but but with christ we have this yes he's lord and he never puts being lord but he also says you are my friends if you do what so I call you, and we are brothers with Christ, and that's that's just an amazing thing. And those names and those uh, ways we address Him and He addresses us are are part of that. Did you have a comment? Yeah, I was just thinking through Acts too, and sometimes I get frustrated because it's hard to a little bit hard to keep track of the name changes yeah. in some ways. And I was wondering, I had that question earlier this week, listening to it. Why did Jesus so often? meet someone and give them a new name even when he was walking the earth and it makes me think that it's the same kind of character identification mm. a shift in what i mean what is being emphasized i guess or maybe changes in in the circumstances <laughs> i don't know but i wonder if it's that same because i don't really under why did he go from you know saul to paul why did why was he simon peter why was he you know, like why, and why were there so many Marys? But just, <laughs> well, now that's an easy one. <laughs> but I, yeah, what is that? What's with that a little bit? And is this tied to that? Yeah, well, I don't know that it's tied to it. I don't know that it's not tied to it. I think it has more to do with, with intimacy. When you get into those name changes going all the way back to Abram to Abraham, um, it's a difference in emphasis as to where they're going from there, or you go from Jacob to Israel, which is probably one of the more significant name changes, um, where you go from deceiver to one who strives with God or striving for God, depending on how you uh, interpret that name. Uh, so I, I, I think typically the name changes in both the Old Testament and the New Testament usually have more to do with uh, what their purpose is going to be going forward. It might. I mean, it, that may be part of what these this secret name on the white stone that he gives to each one of us is here's what your purpose is going to be. Um, and, and uh, you know, we're not given enough information to know, but, but it does, uh, it, it can speak both to, again, the intimacy he has with us and we have with him, as well as the authority to say, it may indicate what our, our, our duties are going to be in eternity. I hadn't really thought about it like that till you said it, but that's an interesting thought. And by the way, the reason there were so many Marys is because <laughs> in the New Testament, that word is uh, the Greek word for Miriam, which goes back to Moses' sister. So it was just, it was one of the heroes of the faith uh, as far as women. And, you know, there, there are more women heroes of the faith than we unfortunately hear about, but, there, but at the same time, there are a lot more men mentioned. So you can imagine looking for, oh, you want to name your, your daughter a, a Bible name and you're restricted to their Hebrew scripture, the Old Testament. Uh, that was kind of up there with Ruth and... Um, uh, Esther, uh, which, which, uh, what is Esther, Carol? It's not Esther. But it's, I'll put you on the spot. Hadassah. Hadassah. Uh, but Mary, uh, Miriam was, was a pretty common name and continues to be because, uh, Miriam had a pretty substantial part at, at Moses' site. We don't talk a lot about Miriam, but the Jews do because of her position uh, with, with Moses and Aaron. Good. Anyone else? Laodicea. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. If you don't want to answer this right now, that's okay. Okay. Laodicea. <laughs> no, go ahead. 
I, I have this question, and I'm, I'm, I've been wondering for a long time. Do you think that we will have the same talents that God gave us on earth when we're in heaven, and that we will be able to use those to glorify God? Well, it's it's a valid question. I, I would I would say I don't know so much about talents, but I have to. We of course we've been studying spiritual gifts downstairs. I have to wonder if the spiritual gifts don't endure on because they're spirit given now. Uh, Book of Romans says the gifts and callings of God are without reproach or irrevocable. So I have to to think about that talents. There's a, a difference between talents and spiritual gifts, but but they can go hand in hand, but not, not always. Because some of those talents are, are, you know, learn. We dedicate ourselves to learning this or that. Um, so I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't answer. I don't know. Um, I, I'm just curious what if, if they're, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I'd be, I guess I'd be hesitant to say, I don't know. I don't know. But I, I think spiritual gifts probably do endure, but but you could also probably make a good case that we would exhibit all the gifts of the spirit in, in eternity. I just don't know. I know we're going to have things to do, but it's not clear on what those things are going to be. Uh, because I know God's, when we look at the, and we're going to come into that here in chapter four in a couple of weeks, when we look at the throne room of God, you know, People aren't just set, neither people nor angelic beings are not just sitting on their hands. And even with the 24 elders, to us, we might look at it. And we're going to say, wow, that's pretty boring. They stand up regularly and say, holy, holy, holy. And, uh, you yeah, know, that, for one thing, we don't know that that's the extent of their ministry. Uh, but for another, what a privilege it would be to be the ones that declare the holiness of God on a regular basis. And so uh, there are things that we're going to be tasked with doing because God's just not a God of uh, just being static or, or, or not having things to do. All right. Uh, Laodicea is about 25 miles south of Philadelphia. You can find it on your maps. Uh, it means judgment or justice of the people. It had become the wealthiest city in the region. It was noted for its wool, its banking, and its medicine. Uh, it had a subpar water supply, so it relied on an aqueduct system that brought water from a distance, resulting in gritty, lukewarm water arriving in the city. And you say, well, what difference does that make? Well, in each one of these, and particularly if you take the time to uh, watch those videos uh, from uh, Our Daily Bread, Day of Discovery, uh, he does such a good job of, uh, of taking some of this historical context and showing how Christ used that uh, historical context and what they had in their city as part of his, uh, his counsel or his commendation or his condemnation to kind of spur them on. And this one may be more than the others. The, uh, the context that they were living in is, uh, is part of their problem and has a, maybe a greater effect than some of the others. And, and we, you know, we could spend more time talking about the last one. I, I just encourage you to read a little more. I was going to go back and talk a little bit about the key of David and the, the synagogue of Satan. I think they're pretty self-evident, but um, the idea of the synagogue of Satan was, you know, they were, they were having some uh, extreme persecution from, uh, from the, the synagogues there. And Jesus says they're, they're Jews who are not really Jews. Well, I, Paul talks more about that in Romans that are, are in Galatians that a real Jew is one who has faith in the Messiah. Uh, but here you have an even greater impact on what was going on in the city. It, it, it was having a direct effect on the church. So let's read it and uh, then take a look at it. And to the angel of the church at the Laodiceans write, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of of the creation of God. I know your works that you are neither hot, I'm sorry, neither cold nor hot. I would wish, I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich 
and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As I, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the first thing, of course, in our content is uh, Christ. Um, he says he is the amen. Uh, Jesus is that amen. Uh, as we look in uh, Isaiah 65, 16, uh, God is characterized as the God of truth and that idea of the amen or the uh, let it be so uh, speaks to that truth that Christ is. That I, it identifies him again with, with Christ, I'm sorry, with God. And Jesus becomes the amen of all that God has done. He is the, the final word. Um, as John really points out, especially in op that opening chapter of the Gospel of John, uh, that, that he's the culmination of all that God intends to do. And we're going to see that in its fullness as we go through the book of Revelation, especially as we get to the end. Uh, he is the faithful and true witness. Jesus is the ultimate witness to and for all that God has done. And he is the beginning of the creation of God. And uh, that throws some people into a tizzy because it sounds as though it's saying Jesus had a beginning that he was, as it were, the first thing created by God. But the, uh, the key to that is looking at one of our points of interpretation, and that's the grammatical. And that word beginning there is arche, which is origin or ruler of the creation of God. So it's not talking about being the first one that, that God created, it's saying the same thing that Paul says in Colossians 1, uh, that he is over all. He is, the, he is the Lord over all creation. He is the agent of God's creation and is over all things that, uh, that were created through him. And Colossians goes even farther, says he, all things were created by him and uh, uh, without him, nothing was created or nothing was created without him. And so um, it's, it's emphasizing that, uh, that truth that he has always been. So we have three important statements about Christ that he makes about himself to the church in Laodicea that emphasize uh, who he is and emphasize his authority, again, his authority and his sovereignty. And those are important emphasis because of what he's about to say to them. Uh, and this is the harshest of the seven letters, uh, even though we've seen a couple of harsh ones, this is, this is even more so as he speaks to the church in Laodicea. Uh, there's no commendation, not one compliment to this church. And it's the only church where Christ found really nothing to commend them for. Uh, and folks, as individual believers and as a church, we never want to be in that position where uh, Christ would, if we were going to be met with or receive a letter from Christ or meet Christ face to face for him to be, uh, and, you know, Christ doesn't have to search for things, whether he's searching for something good, he just assesses it as it is. And if we meet him and there's nothing good, he can say nothing uh, praiseworthy. Uh, that's a dangerous place to be. And uh, this church was there. And uh, we're going to see as, uh, as he breaks the rest of it down, that it's in a precarious situation. Uh, the condemnation he has for the church in Laodicea is that spiritually they were like the city's water source. They were neither hot nor cold, uh, but lukewarm or tepid, so, uh, and so disgusting to Christ that he vomits them out. Um, you know, I think this this maybe is a little harder for us to relate to because we have, uh, by and large, we have good water in the United States. Even if you think your water is not that good, it's better than a lot of places I've been in the world. And uh, even, uh, especially when I was a kid, different parts of the country didn't have very good water. We went to some parts in Southern Colorado one year when I was a kid and the water was kind of red and gritty. And uh, that's the closest, I think, 
of water that I actually drank that I could come to as a, a comparison to this. In Mexico, uh, we, did, we drank bottled water. In, uh, in Africa, we drank bottled water. As a matter of fact, Kofi wouldn't even let us eat anything if it had been washed with the water uh, from the tap. We had to, he wanted it to be washed with bottled water. Uh, and uh, in Panama, and the water is much better now, but when we first went down there, uh, you didn't drink the water. Uh, and this, this had such a rich reputation as a city, but the water was terrible. Now, that's important because how, how important is water? It's life and death. It's life and death. I mean, you got to have water. You have to have water to survive. And the water was terrible. Even with all this wealth, the best they could do is to come up with this tepid, gritty, probably cloudy, just disgusting water. Uh, and it's so much so, and, and that's not overstating it because Christ uses it as the illustration to say this why is water is so bad, you just want to spit it out. And he says, You're like that water. You're not, you're not cool and clear and uh and refreshing you're not hot where you could uh, you know at least you could you could drink it and tolerate it or wash with it but you're just lukewarm and tepid and yucky and uh, so he says that that i vomit you out of my mouth and uh that that's a pretty visual picture uh from christ and so not only a condemnation but a pretty harsh condemnation uh they were spiritually deceived why? Because they believed themselves to be spiritually wealthy when they were actually poor, naked, blind, wretched, and miserable. And that's where the context, the historical context really comes in. This is a very wealthy city, and that wealth uh, had manifested itself in the church as well. They probably had a lot of wealthy individuals that were part of the church. The church was probably a, a, a nice uh, setup, whether they had their own building or rented the best of the places to meet in. They... Uh, they put that wealth on display. Uh, but as Paul says to Timothy, that the, uh, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, not money itself, but the love of money, the love of wealth. And they had become dependent upon the wealth and uh, enjoyed the wealth, but spiritually they were the exact opposite. And these are just really powerful terms that Jesus used. Uh, you're poor spiritually, you're naked, you're blind, you're wretched and miserable. And all those things speak to their spiritual condition. And it, it leads many people to say that this was not even a believing church. Um, I don't go that far because if they were, if they were completely devoid of any kind of believers, then I don't I think Christ would not have taken the time to write to them at all. They'd have been gone. Didn't he say something about chastening at the beginning of his... He's going to say it at the end, yeah. He, he, he loves, he, he chastens. So there's got to be believers in the church of Laodicea, but they had become, what well, a term you don't hear much anymore, but carnal believers. They had become fleshly believers. And we need to reacquaint ourselves with that terminology because the, the church today, uh, in, in many ways, has become very much like the church in Laodicea. Uh, very, very carnal, uh, very uh, fleshly rather than very righteous, very dependent upon uh, externals rather than internals. And uh, that's exactly what he's calling them out for. And he gives them some, uh, some counsel. And again, if they weren't believers, then we could make a, the compelling case that Christ would not have bothered to counsel them because they wouldn't understand the counsel. It makes no sense to counsel an unbeliever to do things that an unbeliever is not equipped to do until they come to know Christ. And so Christ in his love for them rebukes them. And we have the same thing in, we've just looked at it in Hebrews on Tuesday nights, uh, that, that God rebukes us and chastens us just like a father who loves his, his child will chasten and rebuke his child and discipline his child. Christ is doing this for this church in Laodicea, and he counsels them to buy from him gold that's refined with fire. God's word is characterized as gold in, in a few places in scripture, but Psalm 19 tells us it's more to be desired than 
gold, yea, the much fine gold, and is sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. So he calls upon them to, to get back to God's word. And uh, we have a, a it, it's one of the reasons we, we want to stay close to the word of God as a church and encourage those that are part of this church to be close to the word of God, because it's when we stray away from the word of God uh, that we can get easily distracted from the things uh, in the world and forget what God calls us to. The most valuable thing we have in our possession. I don't, I don't know what kind of, I, I've been to some of your guys' houses and, uh, and see your cars and, and you see mine and you've been to mine. Uh, you know, those, regardless whether you live in a little house, you live in a great big house, you've got three or four houses. The most valuable thing every one of us have, we have in common, and that's the word of God and the salvation that comes to us from, uh, from God and through his word and through the Lord Jesus Christ. You, this, this, is, this is the most valuable thing we carry around as believers. You know, and I'm not putting above our salvation. You understand, in conjunction with our salvation, this is this is gold, and um, we should treasure it as such. He says to buy white clothes from me. Genuine salvation is characterized uh, in in a couple places uh, in Scripture as white garments, and we've already seen that here in these letters. We're going to see it at the end of the book as well, and so uh, he's telling to. Uh, uh, to have those those garments that befit their salvation. Now he's not talking about them getting salvation. He's talking about the testimony of their salvation that their clothes aren't their white clothes aren't spattered with sin. Uh, and so that's the idea here that they keep their testimony pure, that they keep their reputation uh, unsullied or unspotted. Uh, and then Isaac. Uh, as we mentioned up in the introduction to this letter, uh, Laodicea was known for this ISAB. Uh, you know, for us, doesn't seem like that big a deal. We got all kinds of pharmaceuticals. But again, in this day, there were different regions and different cities that were renowned for certain things. And this is one of the things that um, the Laodiceans uh, were known for. And He's, he's talking about, of course, not literal ISAB, but he's using it as something to illustrate the greater need that they have, and that's the spiritual blindness that they had imposed upon themselves. Because as believers, we're not spiritually blind anymore. We, we have the ability to see the things of God. As a matter of fact, Scripture tells us we can see the deep things of God. But we have to be walking in the Spirit. We have to have those eyes open in order to see. And so what's necessary here uh, to, to open their eyes is repentance. And so the ISAB is, is equivalent to repentance that removes that spiritual blindness and causes them to see uh, what they needed to see and what they needed from Christ. He also counsels them uh, concerning his love for them, which is amazing. You know, when we think about how harsh this rebuke is, Christ reminds them uh, that, that those whom he loves, he is going to rebuke and he's going to chasten when required. And uh, that should be uh, not a threat. That's not intended as a threat. That's intended as a comfort for them, uh, that he would care enough to rebuke them and care enough to discipline them. He calls on them to be zealous, which means to take action and repent. And uh, Christ advises them that he is standing at the door of their church knocking and desiring to enter. And this, this verse is used uh, a lot of times as a salvation verse. It's really in the context, it's not about salvation. Uh, it's about Christ being walked out of a church that bears his name, that has some that belong to him inside, but they won't let him in the church. And so the idea of this is uh, that their fundamental need was to invite the Lord into the church. It sounds ridiculous. Uh, but unfortunately, we see it even in our own day where there are churches that have uh, the name of Christ on the church, maybe have Bibles in the church, maybe, uh, maybe sing about Jesus, maybe talk about Jesus. But, but Christ is not in that church because they ejected the gospel or they prohibited uh, certain parts of uh, doctrine, uh, as we've talked about before, certain hymns that don't that, that admit things that are necessary to salvation, the 
denominations that have taken the hymns about the blood of Christ out of the hymn book because it's offensive. Uh, and so it's really not so far-fetched to understand that Christ is knocking at the door of the Church of Laodicea. It's a church that once bore his name that still has those that know him inside, but they won't let him in. If they open the door, Christ promised to enter and dine with them, and that's what they needed to do. Uh, hit this last one. We'll take some final comments and questions. Uh, the call, uh, again, to overcomers is a, a promised a position in Christ, joining him on his throne. Christ should overcome uh, himself. That's not worded very well. It should be Christ had himself overcome and was granted to sit on his father's throne. Because of this, he can grant the same to his own who are in Christ and will reign with him. That's such an amazing promise. We talk about that. Uh, some people look funny at, at, when they hear that, that we're in Christ or we will be in Christ. And it just means that we are, we are so positionally uh, related to Christ that we, it's like we are in him. We are saying wherever he is, we are wherever we are, he is. That's how it will be. And it takes it a step further because Christ is on the Father's throne. We will be with him and in him on the Father's throne as well. And that's a remarkable thing. Uh, to contemplate and really impossible to comprehend. And then the same uh, postscript, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, comments or questions? Yeah. This was a stark reminder to me that, that Christ uh, this was Christ's uh, assessment these churches long after the church had been started way back in the yes it'd been in existence for a long time yes and christ never physically entered any of these churches yet he has this intimate knowledge about these churches we need to take heed to that because he has that same intimate look at each believer and each, each human being. And he knows exactly what our thoughts and the intents of our heart is. Very good. Uh, that's, that's a great observation. I hope everybody heard that. Um, Marty said that, the, you know, the church by this time is far enough down the road. We're at 90 to 100 AD. So, uh, you know, on seven, 60 to 70 years after the resurrection of Christ, churches have been exist in existence for some time now. And so Christ had never physically in his, in his flesh and blood body entered these churches, but he, look at the intimate way that he knows each one of these churches. And it's the same today. Christ has that, uh, that knowledge of the churches, but he even goes farther. If, if a church is willing to let him come in and dine, uh, and there's an old hymn called Come and Dine. I don't know. We probably haven't sung it in years. But it's that taken from this passage of scripture where, you know, let Christ come in, come in and sit down and dine with us uh, because he already knows the needs we have. Uh, but, but how much more effectively can he communicate the, the counsel and uh, the commendations and the condemnations if there are any uh, to us, if we, if we have that ear and, and hear what he, what he has to say to us. Uh, very good. Good observation. Anyone else? Comment or question? All right. Next week, uh, we're going to go into the rapture. And I, I anticipate maybe just spending a week on it because we looked at it um, a couple months ago. Uh, but if you want to pick up a copy, if you don't have the copy from before, this one's pretty much the same. It just doesn't have as many charts at the end. And it's got the same title as these notes. They're out on the table. Look it over and we'll probably just mainly open it up for questions and comments about the rapture rather than go piece by piece because I think it's a it's kind of a lengthy study but it tries to cover all the objections and all the all the questions uh, so if you'd like a copy you can pick one up tonight let's pray together stop this first <clears throat>